part of that. We are starting a new series this morning, and as you read uh, from the beginning of the book of Job, we want to look at this book. There are 42 chapters in Job, so we were not going to be spending our time studying every single chapter. Um, when I was uh, in church quite a few years ago, our pastor went through Job, and it took him 12 months, one year. I've heard of a preacher who spent 20 six years working through the book of Job. That's not an exaggeration. That's exactly what happened. You would have had a child. The child would have graduated from high school, had children of their own, and you're still working on the book of Job. You will be thankful to know I'm going to try to do this in 12 weeks. It is a challenge in a lot of ways, but we're going to crush this in. It is a fantastic book and very uh, apropos and helpful to us in many ways. You may know about this book, but certainly this theme of this book came to our minds this week, as was already mentioned in our prayer time, about what took place out in Saskatchewan. It was a tragedy that somehow defies explanation. And when tragedies happen, people ask questions. When 29 people on board the bus are injured and 16 of them are killed, you begin to ask, where was God? This is a natural question. One of the fathers was contemplating all that had taken place, and this was what he was quoted as saying. There was no reason for this. Sometimes you think the universe is getting back at you for something you did in a previous life, or something he did in a previous life, or somehow I harmed somebody, so that's the reason for this. That's a heart that's looking for answers. Looking in the wrong places, if I can say politely from a biblical perspective, but searching for why, for what. There's got to be a reason. This is a natural response when wickedness, when evil happens to us. And this is what the book of Job is about. It answers the question of why. It doesn't answer the question of why in a way that feels intuitive to us, or in a way sometimes it even satisfies us. But it gives us God's perspective on the problem of evil. And this little passage that we're going to look at as we look at chapter 1, we're going to see that it's divided very neatly into three distinct and clear scenes. And each one of these scenes sets up the stage for something else to take place. Let's look at this book and begin to answer this question of evil. Scene 1. The very first verses of this book lay out for the reader everything they need to know about Job in a nutshell. Scene one, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil, full stop, one sentence. This sets the stage for the entire book. We learn five things about Job. First is that he is from the land of us. Where is us, by the way? Anyone know? You don't know. Don't embarrass yourself by raising your hand because we've never found us. It sounds made up, but it wasn't. They believe it was a region. They think it was near Edom, what present day Edom. We're really not sure. And there's a charm in the fact that we don't know this man. We don't know his genealogy. We don't know his family. We don't know anything about him. He is from a place that we actually today don't even know where it is. There is something of a blank slate about this man. And there is something about the way this is written to give us an opportunity to lay our lives, our pain, our difficulties onto the template of this blank slate of Job. He is an everyman. He becomes invisible. He becomes nobody important. He is you. He is me. He is a man from us. He is a man from Bracebridge. He is a man from pick your space, your place, fill in the blank. That is the charm of what we're reading about. We know nothing of him. We, what we do know is that he is called blameless, not sinless. Don't be confused by this. This represents his integrity. This shows us right off the bat, at the get-go, that this man is not going to suffer anything because of something in his life. He dealt with his business honestly. He dealt with his family honestly. There was nobody in the community that could lay charge against him and say, you are a hypocrite or you are dishonest or you've done something. That 
that's the idea of blameless. He was a good man. He was a respected man. He was an upright man, we're told. So his ongoing lifestyle was to live with integrity. In fact, we know that because we're told that he feared God. Now, this is intriguing. Because the book itself seems to be written in the early chapters of Genesis. And I'll give you some reasoning for that as we look further into this chapter. But the dating of this book takes you right back to the very beginning, even before Exodus was written and before the law was given. So this man had a very limited view of who God was, we would recognize, by the way this book is. For one example, I'll just tell you quick, there's no reference in the book to anything to do with God's law or Moses. That is entirely unique to Old Testament books that were written after the law of Moses. There's always a reference to these things. This book makes no reference to it. It was written during the time of Genesis, it would seem. Perhaps even in the first 11 chapters, we're not sure. But the point being, this man whose limited view of God still allowed him to understand that he needed to live under God. And he turned away from evil. This again is a presentation of his lifestyle. So we know right from the get-go that this man from the land of Oz, who was blameless and upright, who feared God and turned away from evil, everything that happens to him, the writer wants you to know right at the start, had nothing to do with Job. This everything that happens was not a response of what had happened, something that was coming back on Job because of something that he'd done. He was innocent. This kind of balance in fairness is something that we often grasp at in our own hearts. Something bad happens, oh, it must be because of this. This is a common reaction in our own fallen hearts. The disciples did the same thing when in John chapter 9, they saw the man who had been born blind. Verse 1, they passed and saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents said he was born blind. Obviously, there's a problem. Obviously, there's sin in somebody's life. If he was born blind, either his parents were wicked and they're being punished by giving a a blind son, or he had sin in his life before he was born and he was born blind. So obviously, there was obviously a problem. What's the answer? And what does Jesus respond to them? Verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not this man that, that, not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work, the works of God might be displayed in him. That's a perspective we very rarely take when it comes to evil. We think it has to be a balance of somehow something in the universe. But have you ever considered that maybe that this is all about the glory of God? How could that be? That is so counterintuitive to our thinking. But this man was born blind for the day that Jesus could pass by him, touch his eyes and heal him and give evidence to who Jesus was. He suffered so that Jesus could be glorified. That is a perspective we almost never take. But Job, right at the get-go, we know this man, this blank slate of a man, was innocent. And we also know he was rich. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. In that day, in that age, if you had a full family, many children, you were considered blessed. Notice that seven and three, that equals ten. Just hold that in your head. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. You'll notice if you add 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, you get 10. He had 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. You add your 500s, you get 10. This is a number. This is a, a poetic way of saying this man's life was absolutely complete. It was whole. And the numbers themselves give evidence that this man was wise in his, in his business dealings. He was wealthy in every regard. The camels would have meant that this man probably had a trade route going on. He had a business in a far land. He had something going on that he had very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. The end of verse 3. This man was wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. And to put it in our terms, was exactly as tongue-in-cheek that was read to us. How many Rolls Royces did he have in his mansion? How many swimming pools did he have in his yard? That's the picture of this man. So on the one hand, you have a man who is blameless. You have a man who is wealthy, blessed with a family. And we also learn something else about Job. Verses 4 and continuing. 
His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. That's an interesting expression. That is a Hebrew euphemism for your birthday. He used to, his sons used to go and hold a feast. So every time one of his ten children or one of his sons had a birthday, they had a celebration. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So here's the picture. You now get an idyllic scene of a family that is cohesive and loves each other. That's what the author is trying to lay out. He is an everyman, innocent man. He is a wealthy man who's blessed with a family and a big business. And his family loves each other. Every time there's a party, they all get together and celebrate. And they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them and would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. And here's another glimpse of why we know this book is an early book. Because this man is taking on the role as the patriarchs did as the priest for the family. He is not a, usurping the authority of a priest. He is doing what every godly household would do in the age that he lived in. If you feared God, you would act on behalf of your family and respond to God on behalf of your family. He was leading them and showing them that you take God seriously. And to do so, I am going to offer sacrifices on behalf of my family. So he was a godly man who raised his children in the fear of God. It was a family who loved each other. It was a perfect scenario. That's the way the book begins. That's scene one. So that the reader knows right at the start of this book, it's an idyllic family who has no reason whatsoever for evil to come upon them. Now scene two. We know the division because the first words are, now there was a day. Or in our vernacular, once upon a time. What the author is now doing is separating scene one from scene two. No now is what he's saying that everything that's about to happen has nothing to do with the first part. I just wanted to lay out the groundwork of who those people are. But now there was a day totally separate from that, unrelated to that. This happened. Come over here with me is now what he's saying. There was a day and now we have a very curious statement. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. The sons of God we recognize to be angelic beings, celestial beings, created beings that are not human. The sons of God came to pre present themselves before the Lord. What does that mean? I'm sorry, I'm not sure. What is going on in this exchange? The text doesn't tell us. Why is it that Satan can also come in among God in a, when God can look on no evil? I don't know. Stop asking hard questions. All I know is what the text says, and there is some measure of curiosity in all about what is happening here. Interestingly enough, I will point out to you that the literal idea of that word Satan in the original has an article before the name. What it says is, literally is, the Satan also came among them. The word Satan is actually the word for accuser. And so this is more of a title than it is a name. It is talking about a benevolent spirit that we know of as the enemy of God's people. The Satan, also the accuser, that's the idea that the author wants you to see. That there was somebody who also came into the court that day that came for a purpose of wickedness, of accusing. The Satan also came. How this all happened, what the scene is, I'm sorry, we know very little. But the day came when this scene was laid out. And the Lord said to the accuser, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And literally it says, all the way through the text it says, the Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. We immediately know something very plain and clear in regards to evil in our world. We do not live in a dualistic world where good and evil are equal. We know the Bible presents a God who is ever present, who is unable to be anything other than ever present, 
Because God is spirit and infinite. There is no place, there can be no place that God cannot be. He is our ever-present God and he asks the question, where were you? And Satan now delineates that he is very different from God. We do not live in a dualistic society where good is battling evil and they're struggling against each other. No, 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 you have to understand. Good is far, 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 far greater always far greater than evil ever, evil ever will be or ever can be. Evil is limited and Satan himself has to go to and fro. The idea is randomly jumping and leaping from one place to another. He can't be in all places at once. Where have you been? I've been leaping around all over the place. Just trying to find someone to harass is kind of the idea. The Lord said to Satan, verse 8, and this is an intriguing little phrase. Whose idea was it that Job should suffer? Answer, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan. Now that disturbs our intuitive thinking. That is not what we think of when we think of our New Testament God. This lays out for us an attribute, it takes us deeper into the character of God than our simple minds often want to go. That we rebel against this idea. That God would have any hand in this and yet, he actually doesn't. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? It's just a question. And Satan answered. The Lord said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and his possessions have increased in the land. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. The evil one now turns the table. Have you considered Job, God asked, and now the Satan, the accuser, he now turns and says, why would I consider him? I can't touch him. You have had a hedge around him and you, again you begin to see the distance between evil and God. That the Satan has no ability to touch this man Job because he is being protected by God. You have put a hedge around him and I can go nowhere near him. It is you that's made this man upright is the accusation. You have blessed him because you've protected him. Oh, you say he's blameless is the accusation. You think he's a wonderful man and he is only a fair weather follower. Oh no, you touch his life, God. You pull that hedge away and you will see what this man is really going to do. He will curse you to your face. That's what will happen. And the accusation turns back from being on Job and turns back to God. You are not a good God. You are not allowing this man to have free will. You are not allowing evil into this life for us to see what this man is made of. You are not being good because you are protecting him from all things. That's the accusation. What? And so God responds to this accusation. This is not a bet. This was not a wager. But the Lord said to the Satan, to the accuser, Behold, I now give you permission, is what he's saying. All that he has in your, is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now this is where it gets interesting. What we see very plainly is that evil has its place. And somehow it is connected to the permissive will of God. Somehow it is connected to the fact that God allows things to happen. But he hasn't forced this thing to happen. He has said to Satan, I will lift my hedge, if, as it were. I will allow you to touch him. But it doesn't mean you have to. It doesn't mean that you're obligated to. It, evil always remains outside of God. In fact, if you know this quote, <clears throat> don't know this quote, sorry, you should know this, by Thomas Watson. He was a, a Puritan preacher from the 1600s. In his book, The Providence of God, great little phrase. God is the cause of no man's sin. 
It is true that God has a hand in the action where sin is, but no hand in the sin of the action. Do you follow that? Yes, God gives permission for evil to take place, but God is never the author of evil. God is never guilty of the evil that happens. He allows it to happen. This we find counterintuitive to our God. And it raises the question, why? Welcome to the book of Job. Why? Here is an innocent man. We actually don't find the full answer to this question until you get all the way to the end of the chapter, or to the end of the book. Oh, you have to wait that long? Seriously? Scene three. We've seen Job. We've seen this idyllic rich man who has innocent in all ways. We've seen a scene in heaven where God lifts his hand of protection on Job and has given permission to the accuser to go and touch this man's life. And now you know these well-known events. There was a day. See what's happening? Now, this is again just a way of getting the reader to understand. This has nothing to do with that. This is once upon a time again. Taking you back just a random day. This, there was a day when his sons and daughters were e eating and drinking wine in her older brother's house. This is again, this time of festivity. This is not debauchery. This is just a good, clean, fun of family get together. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down their servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. There's a perfect day, sunny, bright day, great festivities going on in the house, and all of a sudden somebody comes flying into Job's house and says, the, the oxen, the donkeys, they're gone. The servants, they're killed. There goes Job's one-third of Job's business. And yet, while he was still speaking, there came another. Now that, that is a fascinating way for us to get the drama of this scene. This man has run through a field. He's standing in the doorway in my sanctified imagination trying to catch his breath and tell Job the news and he's still explaining the news and another guy shows up at the door and he's there trying to catch his breath and he's trying to now talk over the first guy. You won't believe it. The fire of God fell from heaven. This is an expression probably of lightning. That's sort of the idea that we would surmise that he's referring to. And he burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. So, if that's what took place, regardless, a lightning strike, that's what it would make the most sense from the text. A lightning strike and perhaps some, you know, in the dry brush of the heat, something catches fire or there's some moisture on the ground and they're electrocuted. We don't know. The one man who's standing on a fallen log, I don't know. He survives. That's what happened. So just like that, now, half of Job's business is instantaneously wiped out. And while he's still speaking, what? I mean, how do you go from a day that's bad to a day that gets really bad in one fell swoop? So this guy can barely get his sentence finished to explain what happened and another shows up. The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. And there goes Job's entire business proposition. All of his animals, all of his servants, gone. First one, a man-made man evil. Second one, you might say, an act of God. Third one, again, man-made evil. What is going on? That all of a sudden, Job is bankrupt. Just put that into your perspective. What would it be if suddenly you discovered that your house is burned to the ground and your insurance doesn't cover it and your insurance company tells you they can't help you out and your bank account has been evaporated and you are left with nothing. That's the scene. And while that man was still speaking, there came another. Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. They were in there having a birthday party. Behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. What do you do 
when you get news like that. Now, it's one thing to lose your business, but in one day to lose everything you own and also to lose all of your children, you would think that this is an exaggerated story if it were not an inspired scripture. This is the event of a man who we can lay all of our, all of our tragedies and all of our circumstance on top of him and say, why? He was an innocent man. He deserved none of this. He did nothing to merit any response in any way of evil. What is going on? There are times when the questions run so deep they seem to go for. Ever, and our hearts are so hungry for an answer. We reach out and it feels like God must not be there. What is happening? This is the life of Job. And this is act four, again, an act of nature. Now, I just point out some poeticness to this. There are four things that happen. Two of them are man-made. Two of them are what we would call acts of God or mother nature, if I can even use that phrase, which is not a phrase we should even be using because God is not a mother and he is the one who rules nature. Do I need to tell the church that? I would think not. We have four events that take place. Two man-made and two natural, if you want to say it that way. Four. And they seem to come from Four directions, if you want to see it that way. North, south, east, west. In fact, people have tried to pick out that that's the way the wind would come from the east and the Sabaeans came down from the north, the Chaldeans would come up from the south. These are from all points. The idea is this was absolutely devastating to the nth degree to wipe this man out as far as anybody could be possibly wiped out and destroyed in one single day. It was a work of the evil one and that is the picture we get of this man. Scene three is not a pretty picture. And how does Job respond? Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. These are not things we do clearly in the 21st century in the Western world. But in Job's day and age, this was the natural response that you had to show your mourning. He's not jumping up and clicking his heels. This is not him putting on a happy face. This is not him pretending that everything is great. Oh, God is in the heavens and everything's fine. No, no. This man is in deep distress. Understand that when wickedness and evil comes, there is nothing wrong with human emotion that reacts against it, that longs for answers, that calls out in agony and tears, that destroys, that, that, that is distraught from our heart. There's nothing wrong with that response. I mean, in our context, I don't know what this would be. Tore your robe, shaved your head. What, what would that be? You, you, Put on black clothes and wait for your neighbors to come and bring you potato salad. I don't know. But it's some response that Job has because it's not just him blowing this off. Understand that. And he fell on the ground and complained. Is that what the text says? He fell on the ground and he lamented. That this had no reason to happen to him. And he fell on the ground and he had a pity party. That he was the innocent victim and God was not being good. He fell on the ground and then called his pastor to look for some sympathy. To put his name on the prayer chain. To have everybody gather around and tell him that he's a good person and that he doesn't deserve this. And to look for somebody to pat him on the head and hold his hand and walk with him through the darkness. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But that is not what Job did. And this is where we begin to see a fascinating example of a man who knew his God. And this is so key to us in the midst of tragedy. The reason we have such a hard time against tragedy is because we have such a low view of God. Our understanding, our theology of God is so muted, so stunted, so small that we immediately panic, that we think God's lost control. We begin to be believe he's not there. Whatever small things we start to get of God. This man knew his God. And it did not shake him because he knew the character of God. 
And his answer was to worship. Yes, his heart was broken. Yes, he was in pain. Yes, he was in mourning. But he knew at the end of it all that God was in charge. I don't know what's going on, but my trust remains in God. This is Job's first reaction Part one to the misery that he faced. And if you know the book of Job, you know it only gets worse from here. He he said, verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. What is that? He is declaring a theology of God. God has given me life. Everything I have comes from him. I came, I was born with nothing. So everything that I have around me was completely a gift from God. So if it came from him, then how do I have any right to complain when he decides to take it back? It was his all the time. This is a deeply mature man who sees, has a perspective of life that so many of us miss. We think we have the right to these things. They are from God, from Job's perspective. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. And this famous phrase, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Regardless, may God's name be praised. Regardless of what happens to me. Can you do that? I mean, this is an example like no other. And to, and to make sure that the reader knows That this is going to continue. The wickedness is going to happen some more still to Job. But the reader needs to know this. The writer wants you to see. In all of this, Job continued to remain innocent. The wickedness and the evil that he's yet to about to experience in chapter 2 had nothing to do with Job. He was an innocent man. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Innocent people suffer evil. Why? Why? What a great question. Sometimes we don't know the answer. We begin to begin to get a glimpse here that it has something to do with a God who allows his permissive will to let evil fall into our lives for his glory. I don't know how many of you know the name Stonewall Jackson. Thomas Stonewall Jackson was a military leader in the Civil War in America I don't know too much about him, um, except that I know that he was a very staunch believer. He took a lot of criticism for his sincere Christian faith, and he lived that out on a daily basis among his men and with his family. On October 22nd, 1854, this man suffered a tremendous tragedy. His wife gave birth to their first child, and the child was born, stillborn. And one hour later, uh, his wife passed away. Uh, The doctors came in and called him in and she was hemorrhaging and on the same day he lost his wife and his only child. Stonewall Jackson wrote a letter to his sister. This letter is still in existence and if you want to see it in his own handwriting you can google for this and find this um, this letter uh, which is still as I said still uh, able we're still able to read it. This is part of an excerpt from a letter to his sister, uh, Sister Laura. I have been called to pass through the deep water of affliction, but all has been satisfied. The Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is his will that my dear wife and child should no longer abide with me. And as it is his holy will, I am perfectly reconciled to the sad bereavement, though I deeply mourn my loss. My dearest Ellie breathed her last on Sunday evening, the same day on which the child was born dead. Oh, the consolations of religion. I can willingly submit to anything if God strengthens me. Oh, my sister, would that you could have him for your God. I have joy in knowing that God withholds no good things from them that love and keep his commandments. And that he will overrule this sad, sad bereavement. Wow. What kind of a man is this? That on the day he loses his wife and child, he writes a letter to his sister who's not a believer. And confesses to her his own own sad bereavement, but uses it as an opportunity 
to remind her that she does not know this kind of comfort in the midst of her tragedies. That his God goes with him. And though he doesn't understand it, he submits to it. Acknowledging and recognizing that it came from a hand of a God who is always good. And God who has purposes beyond our understanding. And who accepts it from God though the pain is dip, deep and rich and real. This man lived out what Job experienced. And this is simply our lesson for this morning. When we are faced with wickedness and evil, yes, there are questions. There are always questions. But what is our response? What is our truest reaction? Is it just self-pity? Is it looking for sympathy? Or is it a response that Job had that Stonewall Jackson took up to just rest, trust, believe in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the confusion to know Blessed be the name of the Lord.